I think it's time we get started. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, very, very good afternoon to all of you. This is Praveen Joseph. I'm speaking to you from Ingro Micro Cybersecurity here in Dubai. And it's uh, it gives me a lot of pleasure today to welcome you for today's training, where we're going to be speaking about one of the most interesting developments in the world of privacy. We're going to be speaking about GDPR. So today's training is called GDPR Foundations. And uh, as part of the training, what we'll seek to achieve is we will get a holistic understanding of the regulation itself. And then we will understand at a high level the steps that organizations need to take in order to implement GDPR. Now, let me just share my screen with you so um, you can see the slides that we prepared for today. Excellent. So I'm going to start off with a very, very short introduction to the whole session itself. What is the uh, plan that we've laid out for today? We'll start with, like I said, we'll start with a very high level introduction to GDPR. Um, we are not going to jump today into the details of the law in the, in the sense we are not going to look at each of the articles line by line because normally that is a two day training. We uh, today's training is a foundational session where we will understand what is GDPR, why was it introduced and what are the key components? What are the uh, headlines of GDPR, if you will? Right, so that's what we will cover. And the last part, we will look at a GDPR implementation roadmap where we will see if an organization needs to actually implement GDPR, what are the key steps that it needs to carry out? What are the high level prioritized activities that it needs to carry out in order to achieve compliance with GDPR? Like I said, I'm coming to you today from Ingram Micro Cybersecurity. Ingram Micro, you're already probably familiar with us. We are the largest technology distributor on the planet. 50 plus billion dollar organization with more than 35,000 employees spread in more than 50 countries around the world where we have offices. We have operations in pretty much every nation that is on the planet, by the way. So a very, very massive network, very huge reach to the market when it comes to technology solutions, technology distribution itself. From the cybersecurity perspective, the Ingram Micro Cybersecurity Practice was set up almost four years ago, back in 2016, here in Dubai. And this is the team from which I'm speaking to you today. So the cybersecurity team today acts as an advanced solutions provider in cybersecurity, where we offer not only services, not only trainings, but also solutions that we have developed in-house by ourselves. There are four predominant flagship products that you see over here, Discovery Virtual Lab, Cybergram as well as multi-vendor architecture. We also offer the traditional cybersecurity service portfolios that organizations expect. We have services which cut across people, processes as well as technologies. So for people, we have foundational trainings, we have advanced trainings as well as GDPR related trainings, which is the one that we are attending today. And for processes, we have consultancies, technical assessments, as well as managed security services. From a technology perspective, we, like I said, we are the largest technology distributor in the world. So in any, any major cybersecurity vendor you can think of, we are already distributing their solutions across the Middle East, Turkey, and Africa regions. Now, we're going to jump straight into the slides. Before we do so, let me remind you, we want to make the session as useful, as valuable to you. Let's make, let's pull out the maximum utility from the next 50 or 55 minutes that we're going to be together. So please, please make the session useful, make it interactive by unmuting yourself, asking your questions, sharing your opinions. If you think that I'm saying something which is probably not correct, feel free, please, to unmute yourself and let's, let's have a discussion. Um, I will also learn a little bit from your experience. You can also hopefully learn something from the slides that I'm going to uh, that I'm going to show to you as part of today's training. So let's make it mutually interactive. Let's make it mutually beneficial. If you're in a noisy environment, no problem. No need to unmute. Just use the chat option and share your questions with us. We'll be addressing these questions um, either intermittently or even at the end of the session where we'll have some dedicated time just for the questions. By the way, the session is being recorded. You probably noticed already. 
All our free trainings, free webinars have been recorded in this manner and they've been published on our YouTube channel. If you just search for Ingram Micro Cybersecurity on YouTube, you will locate our channel, channel very easily. And all the, um, I think there's more than 50 to 60 videos, sessions that we have recorded and which are uploaded out there. A lot of cybersecurity topics as well as privacy topics, including GDPR. And from the cybersecurity perspective, we talk about risk assessments, we talk about uh, digital transformation, security risks in blockchain, IoT, etc. So very, very large suite of trainings that we published for the whole world to access for free on YouTube. Right now, let's get jumping straight into the session. We'll start with a fundamental understanding of GDPR itself. There is no doubt, ladies and gentlemen, GDPR happens to be the toughest privacy law in the world as we speak today. As of today, there are close to 80 to 85 countries all over the world who have some sort of privacy legislation or the other. Many of these laws, they have been updated since the advent of GDPR because they want to mirror the same concepts, the same level of detail, the same level of granularity that GDPR brings about. Complying with the different requirements of GDPR, it is not easy. It is not something which can be ca carried out within a short period of time. It is complex and requires a lot of analysis. In fact, today it is two years since GDPR has been implemented. Within the last two years, has GDPR significantly altered the way in which the world views privacy? Yes, the answer is yes. Has GDPR improved the way in which organizations provide privacy implementations for their customers? Unfortunately, the answer is not a holistic yes, because the requirements of the law themselves, they are pretty complex. And as you, as you will see now, the fines are also pretty high. Many organizations are still struggling to achieve true compliance with GDPR. We'll, we'll see this in one of the upcoming slides where I'll show you a statistic as well. Now, what really is the intention of GDPR? Before I overwhelm you with too much information, let's take a step back. What really is the intention of GDPR? GDPR is a regulation. It's a European regulation. There is no doubt about this. You probably heard about this as well. It's a European regulation which was brought about to protect people's right to privacy. What do I mean by privacy? Let's try to define privacy. As imagine a world where there is no 24 bar 7 online connectivity. Those of us who are in our 30s, 40s or 50s or older than this, we can easily relate to this. Back in our younger days, being alone was really a thing. You could be alone in a room and be 100% confident that you're not being watched. We had a right to a private life and we were able to also live a private life. Today, even when you're the only person in the room, you cannot be sure that you're not being watched. No person in this world who is part of an online ecosystem can be 100% certain that the devices that we are using are not tracking us. As I'm giving you the session, of course, this is a session which is over Microsoft Teams, but I have my mobile phone right here next to me and I don't know what apps are probably recording my voice as I speak. Privacy is defined as the right to be alone, the right to be in true solitude. One of the many, many definitions of privacy actually talk about this, to be alone. And this is a right which is being challenged significantly since the advent of digital technologies. The internet was just the beginning, but with the advent of mobile, as well as, of course, the internet of things right now, people's right to a private life, the right to be alone, is something that is being challenged significantly within the last five to ten years. Within Europe, privacy is something which is considered to be a fundamental human right. Ever since World War II ended, a lot of privacy-related regulations were brought about in Europe just to ensure that the horrors of the war were not repeated. They, they maintained that privacy is to be considered a fundamental human right. And this was etched across many charters, many laws in Europe. So GDPR is a regulation which seeks to protect people's right to privacy. Not only this, it is also very, very relevant to 
today's challenges, which is what I'm highlighting over here. It addresses present day privacy challenges in, for example, online monitoring. When you don't know that you're being tracked, you have a right to at least be informed that this particular app is going to be recording you all the time because it needs access to your microphone on your phone. You don't know what the cookies that are stored on your on your devices. What are they doing? What information about your browsing activities are they tracking? We don't know this. If some organization is collecting my email ID, but they're going to be using that email ID to send me marketing emails or SMS on my mobile phone number. These are all present day challenges which are a major hindrance to protect people's privacy. GDPR seeks to give people control of their private lives. People as in ordinary citizens, ordinary individuals, giving them control over their right to a private life. Now, there are many questions which can come to our mind as we speak right now. When I say citizens, is it only something which is applicable to European nationals, to citizens of European countries? The answer is no, ladies and gentlemen. GDPR does not depend upon your, your nationality or your passport status or visa, nothing like this. We'll talk about this in one of the upcoming slides. What is the applicability of GDPR? I know I mentioned GDPR is a European regulation, but we can only call it a European regulation just to distinguish it from the whole slew of other privacy regulations that we are seeing in different other parts of the world. We have privacy laws in even across many of the GCC countries. We have privacy law in Oman. We have already a privacy law active in Bahrain. There is one expected in Kuwait and federal privacy laws expected here in the UAE. DIFC data protection law was just passed. It's active from July 1st onwards. Just two weeks ago, it became officially active. Even outside of the GCC, we have privacy laws in Brazil. In Africa, we have a privacy law in Nigeria. We have privacy law in the APAC region as well in Hong Kong, Singapore, India. 80 plus countries around the world, they have some form of privacy law or the other. And not to mention, of course, the, the G5 nations, right? Australia, USA, Canada, and of course, Europe with GDPR. GDPR is definitely a, a, a European regulation, but it applies to the whole world. It applies to the whole world if they are meeting specific conditions. Not only this, GDPR is the first time that we are seeing fines which are as high as 10, 20 million euro. The fines that GDPR is levying upon violators are for the first time so high that organizations have no chance, have no choice but to get up, take notice, and to develop a compliance roadmap. Why do we need GDPR? I've explained to you the intent of GDPR. I've explained to you a little bit about the features of GDPR, but what really drove the need for GDPR? The first one, of course, is technology. As big data technologies, as data-driven technologies have gained prominence, especially within the last five years, as mobile has become way cheaper, as access to internet, even in the 11th mile, the most remote parts of the world, as internet access is becoming a reality, especially with 5G now holding a lot more promise. Like I just told you, people's ability to protect their private lives has become hindered. People don't even know that they are being monitored in many cases. And guess what? The companies that are do performing these monitoring activities, they are legally supposedly protected because, because why? People have gone and clicked on, I agree to the terms and conditions without reading these terms and conditions. All of these facts that the company is going to be monitoring us, even without our knowledge, it's embedded. It is hidden within those legal paragraphs that we have very, very casually gone ahead and accepted to without even digging deep inside. GDPR seeks to solve this problem. GDPR has not been successful in solving the problem, let's be honest, but at least it is a step in the right direction. We'll talk about this as we go around the slides. Another challenge that GDPR is seeking to solve is the lack of in-house privacy expertise. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the field of privacy is something which was earlier considered to be more, more focused for legal professionals, lawyers, we have data protection lawyers, we have privacy lawyers and so on. But with the advent of technology, the, the subject of privacy, especially within the last three years, we've noticed that it has it is overlapping with multiple other domains. It is not a legal team's problem. It is it is a problem for the entire organization. Cybersecurity, HR, finance, marketing, IT, 
all of these teams have to work together for the privacy program of an organization to succeed. Not to mention senior management sponsorship has to come in. Just like how you and me from the information security background might have noticed cybersecurity or information security is not a technology problem. Similarly, privacy is not to be considered a problem of the legal team. It is a problem of the organization. It's a business problem. This expertise to, to address and solve privacy related problems. This is something which is still a very, very niche skill set. Organizations know that they have a privacy problem, but they don't know what to do about it. GDPR seeks to address this by creating a specific position called the data protection officer, the DPO. And ladies and gentlemen, this position is being emulated by multiple other regulations as well. Not only this, it has created a very, very huge demand for experts in the privacy field since the advent of GDPR. People have been rushing to specialize and certify in GDPR or in privacy related certifications. And there's been a huge spurt in demand for people who have these skills and these certifications. We'll talk about this. Another incentive or motivation for developing GDPR is data security breaches. Whether it is Equifax, whether it is Marriott, whether it was most recently Honda, the one of the leading car makers in the world, or Cognizant for the maze ransomware. Every month, at least one or two major news about a cybersecurity attack hits the headlines. Cybercrime, it's it's close to a one trillion dollar industry today. One trillion, ladies and gentlemen. That's more than the GDP of many countries in the world. Very few nations, I think less than three to five countries have a GDP in excess of $1 trillion. Cybercrime is an industry which is worth at least $1 trillion today as we speak. Cybercrime is a reality today. Organizations are seeing an excessive spurt in the number of attacks that they are facing. Maybe it's small, like a ransomware attack which is charging them $500, or it can be huge, causing the entire business to shut down. In the case of Honda, most recently, a significant portion of the business was impacted because they had to shut down specific plants as a result of a ransomware attack that they were that they were impacted by. I think this was just last month, right? So number of breaches has been increasing. People are trusting their data with data driven companies, but they don't know that their data has been leaked. Your email ID and password, which you had created, which you had shared when you created an account on, let's say, Adobe.com five years ago, that account has now been hacked and your username and password is now available for sale on the dark web. Because normally when when um, user credentials are stolen by cyber criminals, they just put them up on the dark web either for sale or they just publish them for free. You didn't even know that your data was out there. Did Adobe have a requirement to notify you? This is a question that GDPR seeks to address. How can individuals have more control in a world where cyber crime is so dominant? Another problem that GDPR seeks to address is that of outsourcing. There is lack of accountability for privacy. How does GDPR do this? It is defining clearly who is a data processor, who is a data controller. I'll give you a simple example. Um, yesterday I spoke about this as well in one of our trainings. Capital One was impacted last year with, by a data security breach and um, Capital One had had her had a cloud service platform which it had signed up with Amazon AWS cloud service platform. Now, the moment the breach was reported, everybody thought, oh my God, cloud is no longer safe. Amazon is to be blamed for insecure management of Capital One's data. But when you dig deeper, you'll find that the fault was not Amazon's. It was Capital One's because although the cloud, it was a cloud service relationship that they had with Amazon, Amazon was only providing them with a the platform. It was Capital One's responsibility to define components, security components on the platform, security components like firewalls, IDS, IPS, log management, etc. AWS was just a platform. Capital One had to configure the platform. They had failed to configure a, WAF, a web app firewall correctly, which led to the cyber attack, right? So the problem was actually clearly with Capital One. It was with the client. It was not with the service provider. This is one of the cases which made global headlines and we can see this example. Number of other such cases, small and large organizations, when they outsource parts of the business to service providers, they assume the service providers are going to take care of everything end to end, including security. Unfortunately, security is not a tech problem. It is a business problem. It requires 
proper segregation of roles and responsibilities across entities in a customer and service provider relationship. So if, for example, someone is developing an application in a SaaS organization, in a SaaS based relationship, software as a service. Now, in this case, a service provider should give you a secure application, but you are responsible for the data. That's about it. The security of the code is the responsibility of the application developer. If they are deploying it on a data center on a server for you, they have to take care of the security of the servers, the configuration of the firewalls, etc. But if it is you who is doing it, it is up to you as a customer to take care of these parts. Clear lines of responsibility, clear lines of accountability have to be defined. GDPR seeks to achieve this by defining these roles of data processors as well as data controllers. Now, how has GDPR performed within the last two years? 25th of May 2018, GDPR came into effect and it replaced the 20 year old Data Protection Directive 1995. The DPD or Data Protection Directive, ladies and gentlemen, it is GDPR's predecessor, 20 years old and uh, not at all relevant to today's privacy challenges, privacy problems. So GDPR was heavily updated. The privacy law itself was heavily updated and replaced with GDPR, which was very relevant to the problems of today, like I mentioned earlier, email, SMS, direct marketing, uh, cookies and uh, online uh, online tracking or online surveillance of individuals. On 21st of January 2019, we saw the highest GDPR fine ever to be levied upon an organization, which was none other than Google, when they were fined 50 million euro, the highest fine to date by and this fine was levied upon them by the French Data Protection Authority called CNIL over lack of valid consent regarding the personalization of ads. What really is consent? What is ad personalization? No worries, we'll talk about this. Just to let you know, a heavier fine of 205 million euro was also levied upon the British Airways by the UK, but this fine has been deferred. It was supposed to be in 2018. It has now been deferred and with the COVID-19 crisis coming into the play, the airline has managed to um, stay away from paying this fine for quite some time now. But imagine 205 million euros as a GDPR related penalty. That is huge. That is massive. Nevertheless, despite these huge fines, compliance with GDPR still remains below 50% as of the 4th of December 2019. Per this report from uh, IAPP as well as Johnston Young, you see that fully Fully compliant status is available only with 9% of organizations globally, right? Whereas somewhat compliant, moderately compliant, and so on, we have different figures. Overall, compliance is still way below 50%, not when half of the applicable organizations have succeeded in complying with GDPR. On the 1st of Jan 2020, CCPA, which is a California Consumer Privacy Act, came into effect. It is just one of many, many privacy regulations which have spawned all over the world ever since the advent of GDPR, seeking to emulate the same principles and achieve the same goals, privacy protection for the respective jurisdictions that they are taking care of. The most recent addition to this list is the DIFC data protection law, which is just two weeks old and applicable to the jurisdiction of the Dubai International Financial Center here in Dubai. Now, what are the components of GDPR? And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, before we jump to the second section, if you have any questions, feel free, please, to type them into the chat. We will be more than happy to, to entertain them. Feel free, please, to type your questions into the chat at any point of time. All right, we're jumping now into the components of GDPR. I've given you a little bit of the background about GDPR. Um, what is it seeking to achieve? Why did it come into effect? And, and how successful has it been so far in achieving its goals? We've looked at this from a high level. Now let's delve into the GDPR itself, into the regulation. What are the different components of GDPR? The main focus of GDPR, ladies and gentlemen, is something called personal data. This terminology, personal data or personally identifiable information, customer data, individual information, et cetera, et cetera. We've seen a number of terminologies for this. What is personal data and how does GDPR define personal data? We will see this on the next slide. Do not worry about this. There is also another category of personal data, which is called sensitive personal data. 
What is sensitive personal data? I will define this as well for you on the next slide itself. What is the difference between personal and sensitive personal data? I'll cover this in a minute. But it applies only to EU individuals. Now, this is a point which I'll have to stress heavily. So this is where we realize, ladies and gentlemen, that the regulation, the GDPR, is not seeking to protect people based on their nationality, based on their passport status, or any other such factors. Any person who is physically present within the European Union is protected by the law, by the regulation. Maybe a person is an illegal immigrant. Maybe he or she is a refugee. It does not matter. As long as they are a natural living person who is physically present within the European Union, they are covered by the GDPR. Now, this begets the next question. What if I am a European national and I am currently traveling outside of the European Union? I'm residing in the UAE, for example. Does the GDPR protect me? Unfortunately, the answer is no, because GDPR is passport blind, I would say, or nationality blind. So it does not matter what passport or religion or, or, uh, or uh, nationality we have. GDPR only looks at physical presence of the person at a particular point of time. If we are in the European Union, yes, no matter who the person is, they are protected under the regulation. Who does the regulation apply to? Now, I mentioned earlier and I emphasize this, it is a European regulation, yes, but it applies to companies, countries all over the world based on specific conditions. What are those conditions? Any organization which is holding or processing EU individuals' personal data. If this organization is established in the European Union and it is processing the personal data of the European Union individuals, it applies to them. Even if the company is not established in the EU, but it is processing personal data or monitoring people who are belonging to the European Union premises, geography, let's say, GDPR applies to them. So let me try to break this down. You are a company which is established within a European Union country and you are processing people's personal data. GDPR applies to you. You are a company which is established in the Philippines, let's say, but you are processing the data of people in the European Union. GDPR applies to you. This is why any country around the world which is doing some sort of commercial relationship with the European Union countries or companies where there is personal data that is flowing for the purpose of trade and commerce, GDPR will apply to them. How and does, does it really apply to companies and countries all over the world? We will see this in just one to two slides from now. I will explain this where we look at does GDPR really apply to you? I have a, a simple flowchart where I've tried to break this down. What is the composition of GDPR? There are 99 articles, ladies and gentlemen, and 173 recitals, which are subsections behind these or between the articles itself. With across these articles, we'll touch upon multiple domains. I will show you 10 of these domains in just a few slides from now. Non-compliance with GDPR, we saw the huge fines. Google had paid a fine of 50 million euro. British Airways has been awarded a fine of 200 plus million euros. Right. This is because the levels of fines that GDPR is levying upon organizations are huge, depending upon the type of violation. If it's a level one violation, your fine could be a minimum of 10 million euro or 2% of your total worldwide annual turnover. If it's a level two fine, it's 20 million euro or 4%. Now, this does not mean that if you've carried out, carried out even a minor infringement of GDPR, you are going to be awarded automatically a fine of 10 million euro. No, this is not the case. You can have a fine which is even as small as 500 euros. There have been some cases. In every case, the court will analyze the context, the gravity of the situation, the seriousness of the violation, and how cooperative was the accused organization with the supervisory authorities, with the investigative powers. If they were cooperative, that also factors towards reduction of the overall fine. So your fine can be as, as low as even 500 euro. These are actual fines to have been awarded to organizations or to the tune of 200 plus million euro. Every case has to be looked at 
on a case by case basis. Right now, I want to explain to you the very, very first bullet point, which is this one, which is what we call personal data, because personal data lies at the heart of GDPR. GDPR, in fact, defines personal data as any information pertaining to an identified or an identifiable natural living person. This simple sentence over here is the actual definition of, G of personal data in GDPR. What we should do is we should break it down block by block. Any information. This means not only your account numbers, not only your employee IDs, not only the, the plates on your car, any information pertaining to an individual. If, for example, a person's performance appraisal report has subjective or not exactly objective, but subjective opinions about the person's performance, that can also be construed as personal information. Just by reading specific statements, if you're able to identify that, yes, these statements pertain to employee ABC, then this is actually personal data pertaining to employee ABC. It does not have to be the PII that we are we are traditionally used to, like your card numbers, your account numbers, and so on and so forth. How someone performed in a test, you pass the test, that is your personal information, whether you passed or failed, that is also your personal information. Performance appraisal reports, personal information. Opinions expressed, personal information. Now there is one more category of personal information which GDPR considers to be more critical. This is what is called sensitive personal data. Personal data, there are specific requirements which GDPR has if you're going to be processing personal data, but for sensitive personal data, it is more crucial, it is more critical, so the requirements are more serious. What is the sensitive personal data? This is where we'll talk about the more crucial aspects, the more controversial as well sometimes, like a person's racial origins, ethnicity of the person, the person's religion, the political affiliations or affiliations of this particular person. Also, health information. If someone had tested positive for COVID-19 in today's context, this is sensitive personal data as per GDPR. How effectively are organizations processing the sensitive personal data in line with GDPR? This is an ongoing challenge that countries within Europe are right now facing as we speak today, ladies and gentlemen, because as you know, when we are debating, when we are as a nation, when we are trying to fight against the virus COVID-19, the only way we can do this is by collective sharing of data. If someone has been tested positive for the virus, that fact that he or she has been tested should be given to the government authorities. They should use this information to control the spread of the virus. They have to notify all the people who are in contact with this affected individual. GDPR considers this sensitive personal data. There are additional requirements around processing the sensitive personal data, which some countries are looking at as an additional overhead. In fact, for that matter, Hungary just last month, they have raised a request to relax or to pause some of the GDPR related requirements as they are battling COVID-19. Because like we saw earlier, the requirements are not easy. They are very, very difficult. They are very, very detailed, right? So another point to remember is any identified or identifiable natural living person, GDPR it protects them, which means it does not care about, like I said earlier, nationality or anything else. As long as a person is alive, he or she is protected. And also he or she should be identifiable through this personal information. If you just have a few facts, but they are not going to help you to, to pinpoint the finger against one individual with at least reasonable accuracy, GDPR will not consider it to be personal information. For example, if you give if someone gives you a, a, a piece of information which sounds like this, 25 to 30 year old male who lives in one of the Gulf countries. This is not going to point at any person in particular. We don't know who this person is going to be. Absolutely, this is not personal information. But if you say something like 25 to 30 year old male who is living in this specific locality in Dubai, 
and he's working in this particular sector, you can with reasonable accuracy, you can pinpoint who this person is. This is considered to be personal information. Right now, who are the key entities in GDPR? I've explained to you what the heart of GDPR is, which is personal information. Now let's look at the different entities. This person about whose personal information we are talking, this person who is being protected by GDPR is called the data subject. An identified or identifiable natural living person. The organization or the entity which determines the how and the why of processing this person's data is called the data controller. I'll explain data controller on the next slide as well. But this entity is the one who determines the how and the why, the purpose and the means of the data processing. The data controller may assign some of the processing activities to a supplier, to a service provider, an outsourced contractor. This organization is called the data processor. The data processor is the entity who will process the personal data on the behalf of the data controller. They don't determine anything. They don't make any decisions about the how and the why. They just do something for the sake of the data controller and they get paid for that. That's about it. Overseeing this entire ecosystem is a national data protection authority. These are government bodies. There is one such data protection authority for every country in the European Union. These are bodies who have been empowered to enforce GDPR within their respective countries. There is a DPA for Italy. There is a DPA for France, for Germany, for the UK, as long as the UK remains within the European Union at least, um, and so on. So for every European Union country, we have one DPA and they are responsible for enforcing GDPR within their respective countries. They can be called DPAs or they can be called supervisory authorities, data protection authorities or supervisory authorities, right? Now, a little bit more about these data controllers and data processors. Let me try to break it down for you. The data controller will alone or jointly with others determine the how and the why of data processing. The processor, on the other hand, they will process the personal data only on behalf of the data controller. They are accountable to the data controller. The data controller has far wider legal obligations because they are the entity who are making the decisions about the processing of the data itself. Excellent. A question which you and I might have very often is, does GDPR apply to me? We need to answer this question from two perspectives. One is me being a person, and the second one is me being a company. Does GDPR apply to me as a person? Does GDPR apply to my organization? Let's try to understand. If you are an EU individual, Yes, GDPR applies to you. I'd already clarified what the EU individual is. Any person who is physically located within the European Union, that's about it. You may be a person with a European passport, but as long as you're outside of the EU, you are not technically protected by the GDPR. The moment you fly back into your home country, yes, you're covered. What about organizations, data controllers? Do you have an EU establishment? Yes. Are you processing personal data? Yes, then GDPR applies to you. If you don't have an EU establishment, doesn't matter. Maybe you're established in the Philippines like we saw earlier. Are you offering goods and services to people in the EU? If the answer is yes, GDPR applies. Are you tracking or monitoring the behavior of people in the EU? If the answer is yes, GDPR applies to you. So very, very simple questions. If, for example, you are a real estate company which is established in the Middle East, but you're targeting people in the EU, you want them to purchase your properties, you have an EU website, whatever it is. In this case, GDPR applies to you, even if you don't have a company which is incorporated within the European Union, it does not matter. GDPR would apply to you. Jumping into the context or the contents of GDPR, there are 99 articles like we saw earlier, 173 recitals. Within these articles and recitals, there are 
10 domains that you will see. This is what I have enlisted over here in this particular slide. The first one is what we call legitimate and lawful processing conditions. There are six criteria which GDPR lays out and tells you that if you're going to be processing personal data, it should be on the basis of these legitimate lawful processing criteria. The second one is what we call consent and legitimate interests. If you're going to be processing personal data, one of the options for us is to base it on the consent of the people whose data we are processing. Consent is a freely given, specific, as well as informed and unambiguous indication of the data subject's wishes towards processing their personal data. Someone is telling you, you can download my app, but unless you consent to me processing your personal data, you cannot use my app. This is not freely given consent. Someone is telling you, I want to hire you. You can join my company, but I'm, you're going to have to consent towards me processing your passport and so on and so forth for employment purposes. Well, this is a legitimate reason, but the consent that that employee, that potential employee is giving, that is not valid consent. It should be freely given. You have consented to one ins instance of your data processing, but that data that you're giving is being used for other purposes. It's being shared with third party marketing companies. This is not informed. This is not specific consent. It has to be specific for every instance where your data is going to be processed. It has to be informed. You have to know as an as a data subject that you are, your data is going to be processed. Accountability and notification. Data controllers have multiple accountability re requirements. They have to have an information security program. They need to have data protection by design, data protection by default. They have to invest in data pseudonymization. What are all of these terminologies? Ladies and gentlemen, we don't have the time today to delve into these terminologies. These are part of the two day training that we cover from Ingram Micro. Records of processing as per Article 30 of GDPR, they need to maintain a record of every instance of personal data that they are processing. They need to hire a data protection officer, which is the, in the position that I mentioned earlier that GDPR has created. People who are skilled, they have the right skills, the right qualifications also to develop and maintain a privacy program for the organization, an in-house internal privacy program for the organization. A DPO is a person who is supposed to be reporting to the C-level, the highest level of management within the organization. He or she is responsible for championing privacy within the company. He or she will be given access to all the resources that he needs to upskill himself or herself. He or she should be acting fully independent without any influence from the senior management within the organization. They should be fully independent and they will be answerable to the data protection authorities. If there is a data security breach, for example, the DPO is a person who is going to contact and be the single point of contact for the data protection authority. The company also needs to carry out a data protection impact assessment, which is something like a risk assessment from the perspective of privacy. What are the privacy related risks? And the DPO will have to sign off on the data protection impact assessment, by the way. If the company is going to be exporting data, like transferring it outside of the European Union, it has to do so on the basis of specific conditions. What are these conditions? Within the European Union, some countries have been given the decision of adequacy. I mean, outside of the European Union. There are 11 to 12 countries outside of the European Union who are been given the decision of adequacy, which means the data protection mechanisms within these countries are adequate or equivalent to what you have within the European Union. If a company is transferring data outside of the European Union to one of these 11 or 12 countries, it is freely acceptable as per GDPR. We have countries like Canada, like Australia, et cetera, in this list. The US is not in this list, by the way. But if you're going to be transferring to any other country, it has to be on the basis of other conditions, binding corporate rules or BCRs, code of conduct, and so on and so forth. So based on which conditions, which criteria you're going to use, you can transfer data outside of the European Union. Information provision is nothing but providing information to 
people before collecting their data. It's called privacy notice. GDPR has brought about some ways in which the privacy notice can be made easier for people to understand and to acknowledge. It's not like a long, lengthy uh, you know, document which nobody reads. They just crawl all the way down to the bottom and click on yes, I accept. Go ahead and process my personal data. No. GDPR recommends specific things like layered privacy notices, standardized icons and so on to simplify and make privacy easier for every people, every person to assimilate and to digest. Also, data subjects are given specific rights under GDPR. We have the right to object to processing, the right to withdraw consent, the right to be forgotten, etc., and so on and so forth. If there is a data security breach, within 72 hours, the organization has to notify the Data Protection Authority. There are many requirements under personal data breaches as well under GDPR. Ladies and gentlemen, I've given you a brief introduction to the regulation. I've spoken about how GDPR defines personal data, who are the key entities, what is a controller, what is a processor. I've also shown you a simple flowchart where we try to analyze, does GDPR apply to you? And we looked at these top 10 domains of GDPR, starting with those processing criteria, consent, accountability, uh, records of processing, hiring the DPO, carrying out the data protection impact assessment, if you're going to be transferring data outside of the EU, what are the criteria? What are your information provision obligations, like for example, the privacy notice? What are data subjects rights? And lastly, data security breaches, personal data breaches. If there is a data breach, within 72 hours, you have to notify the Data Protection Authority. I hope I've given you some information about the what aspects of GDPR. Again, your questions are most welcome, so please Keep them coming. There are a few questions from Manish. Thank you so much, Manish. Thank you so much for this. What I'll do is I will quickly cover the last part and come back to take all the questions collectively. Since I see we are slightly pressed for time, we have like 12 minutes left, but I'll go quickly on the last part and we'll come to the questions. Now, if you're going to implement a roadmap for GDPR within your organization, what is a potential roadmap that you can follow. What you see over here is Ingram Micro's GDPR implementation roadmap. Like, you've, like you're aware by now, we, are, we host a team which has expertise in GDPR trainings as well as GDPR implementations. We have a lot of services pertaining to GDPR assessments, GDPR consultation, as well as GDPR implementation itself. This is a roadmap that we follow when we have to implement GDPR for an organization. We have a four-prong, four-phase approach covering assess, protect, sustain, as well as respond. What we do in assess is we will perform material as well as territorial scoping. We will identify whether the organization needs to appoint a DPO, and we will identify compliance with the data processing principles of the organization. Right. So what happens here is in material scoping, we'll find out what personal data the company is processing and territorial scoping, we'll find out which countries of the world are applicable are to be brought in under the scope of the organization itself. DPO, if the organization needs to hire a DPO, we can support them in trainings or we can advise them on where they can find already qualified candidates for DPO positions. Data processing principles, that are those six criteria, the pillars of GDPR, lawfulness, fairness, transparency, data security, purpose limitation, and so on and so forth. Sorry, purpose specification and collection limitation, and so on and so forth. We can ensure that data that the organization is processing is aligned with the data processing principles. After the assess phase is done, we will now come to the protect phase. Here we will start building the controls needed to comply with GDPR. Consent, data subject rights, data security, like for example, data protection by design by default, data pseudonymization, information security process, uh, program, carrying out the data protection impact assessment. And if there is going to be any international outside of the EU transfer of personal data, ensuring we have the right controls in place as per GDPR. So development and implementation of controls, design and implementation of controls around all of these GDPR requirements, we will do it in the protect phase. In sustain, we are looking at ongoing compliance, 
we cannot be certified in GDPR today. That's not something which exists. What we can do is achieve a state of compliance and then maintain the state of compliance on an ongoing basis. So we seek to sustain it, ensure adherence with code of conducts, certification mechanisms which still don't exist, by the way. If there are any fines, how do we handle those fines? Lastly, we come to the respond phase. If there is a data subject access request, we need to respond to it within 60 days, so we ensure that the controls are in place for this. And if there is any data security breach, we will need to notify the DPA within 72 hours. Like I mentioned earlier, we can we will build the, the framework for detecting as well as responding to data security breaches and updating the DPAs within that 72 hour time frame. Quick look at each of these phases phases in the SS phase. We can help you to appoint the DPOs. We can help you with our trainings because we are already an Ingram Micro, uh, sorry, an IAPP certified training partner. We offer trainings on CIPPE as well as CIPM. These are the two most respected, the most reputed certifications for a DPO to hold. And Ingram Micro can provide this for you. From the protect phase, we can help you to develop data protection by design as well as by default and also invest in data pseudonymization uh, requirements. We can perform data classification services. We can develop, we can perform your data protection impact assessment. We can develop a holistic information security program for your organization from scratch. From the sustained perspective, we can perform a GDPR readiness assessment to ensure that you are ready and not going to be uh, you know, facing any specific fines. We also implement overall G GDPR programs for organizations, GDPR frameworks for organizations from scratch. Lastly, in respond, again, we can perform the readiness assessment to see if you're ready to respond to breaches within 72 hours. We can also carry out data security risk assessments to notify data subjects, if at all there is a high risk to their rights and freedoms in the aftermath of a data security breach. This concludes the whole training, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you found it useful. To summarize, we went through GDPR, we discussed why it came about, what does it seek to achieve, and how effective has it been within the last two years, ever since it came into effect on May 2018. We also looked at the, the components of GDPR, starting with personal data. We looked at data protect, sorry, data controllers as well as data processors. And then we looked at those 10 domains of GDPR, which I mentioned earlier, the processing criteria, uh, DPO, data protection impact assessment, information provision, cross-border data transfers, personal data breaches, data subjects rights, etc. We looked at a very brief implementation roadmap for GDPR co covering across, cutting across assess, protect, sustain as well as response phases. I hope the session was useful. We'll now look at the questions. Question from Manish is, Dubai has its own privacy laws, so should we follow GDPR? Question is, if a country has its own privacy law, should they follow GDPR? Why only GDPR needs to be followed? Excellent question, Manish. Very, very, very relevant question. And this is a valid point because a lot of countries, 80 plus countries worldwide, they have their own privacy laws. So these laws will first take precedence over international laws. It is not a fact that you have to comply with GDPR first and you have to ignore your own local laws. The best practice or the general rule of thumb is whichever is more strict, it is better to comply with that. For example, if GDPR tells you to retain records for 30 days, but your privacy law tells you to hold on to it for 60 days, you're not, your local law tells us this, it's always better to comply with the 60 day requirement to avoid any confusions. Of course, balancing cost and other considerations as well. Um, but that being said, local laws will have to take precedence over uh, international regulations. GDPR is an international uh, regulation. Local laws are more strictly enforceable and we have to pay attention to them first before we pay attention to international regulations. Another question from Manish, who collects the fine? If it's the government, why should they keep the fine as an entire breach chain of privacy? They were not directly impacted. It's always a person, and if the person is affected, does the collected fine get shared with that person itself? Again, a beautiful question, um, Manish. Thank you so much for this. 
Um, I'll be honest with you. I don't know why the fines are being paid out to the data protection authorities. The fines are, by the way, enforced by the DPAs. The fines are uh, collected by the data protection authorities. But are they being shared with the affected individuals? The answer is no. I've not seen cases where, for example, in the Marriott breach, uh, people who are impacted, they were actually compensated by the government authorities. This was not. This is something which is still being uh, uh, discussed. This is something which is still being um, uh, evaluated. So there has been no uh, actual, uh, you know, payout to the impacted individuals because there's no such contractual agreement between the company as well as their customers, between Marriott and the customers, for example. But um, your question is right. Your question is right because the government is actually bringing them out, but um, the people, are they being paid in the right way? We don't really know about this. This is still being evaluated case by case. Okay, recently only one known case where individuals can, okay, so there's been one case in, in the case of Yahoo where people can actually get paid, but in the majority of the cases, I see that the money is being amassed by the DPAs and hopefully being spent to invest or to strengthen the privacy laws within their respective jurisdictions. There's been one case with Yahoo, like Manish has rightly pointed out. Thank you so much, Manish. I'll dig deeper into this as well. Thank you. All right. Any further questions, ladies and gentlemen, feel free, please, to type them in. All right. So again, on behalf of Ingram Micro Cybersecurity, it was an honor and a privilege to be able to speak with you today. Thank you so much for your time as well as your attention. This particular session is going to be up on our YouTube channel, which is Ingram Micro Cybersecurity. If you just type these four words on YouTube, you'll locate us very easily. Um, on behalf of the entire team, thank you so much, and I wish you all an excellent rest of your day. Thank you and take care.